Thank you for joining us tonight for Cultivating Creativity. I'm Kat Keltrick, the Campus and Community Engagement Coordinator at Northrop, all the words in that title. And we're so excited to present this discussion this evening with our partners at the Coven and the Master of Arts and Cultural Leadership here at the University of Minnesota. Thank you to those partners. This discussion is part of a year long residency with Ragamala Dance Company called Ragamala Rooted. It is leading up to performance of Fires of Our Nazi in April, hopefully in person at Northrop. For more information about that residency work and the performance, please check out Northrop's website for more information. That's at northrop at umn.edu. Before introducing the panelists and moderators for this evening, I do want to point out that there is a Q&A portion for this evening. And you're welcome to enter those questions directly into the Q&A button, probably at the middle bottom of the screen, hopefully I'm pointing near it. Uh, you're welcome to use that function. Uh, we'll be monitoring that uh, for questions at the end. Please be sure to change your default setting in the chat on the side from all panelists to all panelists and attendees. And feel free to welcome each other and introduce yourselves, say where you're tuning in from, since I know we're an international crowd this evening. Uh, if you'd like to turn on captioning, please click the CC button also at the bottom of your screen. It is my honor to introduce our panelists from Ragamala Dance Company this evening. They're gonna be very short bios because I, these are accomplished women, but I want them to be able to speak their own experiences a little bit more after this. So we have with us this evening, Rani Ramaswamy, who has been a choreographer, performer, and teacher of Bharanatyam, the classic dance of South India in Minnesota since 1978. She founded Ragamala Dance Company in 1992 and currently serves as co-artistic director, choreographer, and principal dancer, along with her creative partner and daughter, Aparna Ramaswamy. Aparna is co-artistic director of Ragamala Dance Company with her choreographic partner and mother, Rani. As dance makers and performers, they explore the dynamic tension between the ancestral and the contemporary, merging their hybridic perspectives as Indian American artists. Ashwini Ramaswamy is choreographic associate dancer and director of marketing and publicity for Ragamala Dance Company. Ashwini has studied with Rani and Aparna, her mother and sister, since the age of five. As a founding member of Ragamala, she has toured extensively, performing throughout the US, in Russia, Taiwan, Indonesia, Japan, the UK, and India. I am so pleased to introduce our moderators for this evening. Dean Sri Zahir, became the 12th Dean of the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota in 2012. During her tenure as Dean of the Carlson School, Sri has increased the business community's engagement with the school, resulting in a wealth of new experiential learning opportunities for students, and has overseen the introduction of new, degree, new degrees in business analytics, supply chain management, finance, and new programs in partnership with Singyu University in Beijing, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, and Tongji University in Shanghai, as well as online degrees and certificates. Sri holds the Elmer L. Anderson Chair in Global Corporate Social Responsibility, and her research focuses on international business, a topic on which she has been published extensively. From the coven, we are joined by Alex West Steinman. Alex is a Swiss army knife who knows how to raise humans and build public relations strategies for businesses, politicians, startups, and nonprofits. The co-founder and CEO of The Coven, a community and workspace for women and non-binary folks, Alex is dedicated to the economic empowerment and advancement of women in the Twin Cities. And with that, I turn it over for the evening to our moderators to, to start our discussion. So Dean Zahir, please take it away. Thank you, Kat. Thanks for that introduction. And it's an absolute pleasure to be with these three amazingly accomplished women and Alex to, uh, you know, to have this conversation about uh, cultivating creativity as they navigate this uh, a new world with a very, very ancient kind of traditional form of dance. I mean, it's the, the you know, and you might wonder why what a business school dean who has been doing stuff with supply chains is out <laughs> talking to a group of dancers about. And I wonder myself, but um, I had the privilege of growing up in South India very much. In fact, it turns out that Rani and I were from out from the same city. In fact, we attended the same high school, and we didn't know that for a, a you know for a very long time. 
But I grew up, you know, watching Bharatanatyam, which is the dance form that Ragmala, you know, um, the, the dancers uh, perform. It's a very ancient form. It's uh, 2000 years old. It's from, uh, from South India. And for me, growing up watching that dance form, it, it was all about storytelling. It was about, you know, listening to stories about old myths and so on. But it also, as it has evolved over the years, it's become a, it's a it's become a very malleable and pliable form where you can discuss contemporary issues and you can actually, you know, uh, and watching a performance can lead you to you know question your beliefs, to question your assumptions and see how we can you know make the world a better place so i think there's a lot that this dance form has to offer and i'm just too excited to see what uh, rani and uh, uh, aparna and ashwini you know are going to tell us about it today i'm of course also very excited that they've made a family business out of it and that is the other piece that we will talk about so we will you know i know some of you may not be as familiar with this dance form as others so I've, uh, so we will be showing a brief video of uh, uh, what it's like. And, uh, and then from there, we will go on to discuss uh, the Ragmala's artistic journey, their, you know, their, what they think their legacy is, how, is, how it's going to evolve, as well as uh, their entrepreneurial journey in terms of the, the economics of how they're, uh, you know, they've carried out this family business. So with that, I'm going to just request Aparna to say a few words about what we will be seeing, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Sure, I would be happy to. Um, thank you so much for having us, and we feel very privileged to be here with Sri and with Alex and, and our audience today. So um, thank you all for spending the evening with us. So for this evening's video, um, it's a very short video. I think it's, it runs about six minutes. And we selected excerpts of three works. The first is Written in Water. And we start with rehearsal footage of our dancers in the studio, and then some selections from a performance at Jacob's Pillow. Then we go to a solo that I created called Ishvara. And then the third is our, from our newest production, which is Fires of Varanasi, which Kat mentioned will hopefully premiere this spring. And we are currently in the process of creating that work. So through these works, our intention was to show our audience today the, the rigor and the beauty of this form, Bharatanatyam, which we have dedicated our lives to, how it really is an, an expanse of, of knowledge and wisdom that we feel privileged to spend our days working on. But at the same time, we also wanted to share our creative aesthetic with all of you, how we take a form that really is a language and how we personalize it and what we choose to share of it with audiences. And we can, I'm sure we'll talk much more about it. We can reference these works, but just in brief, that's what uh, you'll see. Tum 
தாக தகதி கிட்ட தும் தாக a thrill to see Bhartanatyam for me being performed in the Northrop Commons and I can't wait to see this premiere in 2021. It must be, you know, just give me an absolute goosebumps. 
So thank you for that. And uh, I think for those of you who may be, you know, unfamiliar with this form, you can see that it's, it has everything in it. It has rhythm and it has melody and it has storytelling and it has extreme expressiveness. I mean, with the eyes, with, you know, with gestures of the, of the hand. So it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a kind of an all encompassing kind of dance medium. And so that's, um, I think probably something that uh, keeps it fresh and alive. But, you know, let's get started. And I think, you know, we want to hear from the artists and I would just love to hear something about your artistic journey before we get into other details. And especially the three of you have, you know, um, uh, have uh, sort of started on this journey in different ways. So I'd love to hear from you about um, how you feel about that. All right, shall I start? So when I came, I came to the United States in 1978 and had studied dance in Chennai growing up as a child for about 10 years, but never to, there was no plan to make me a professional artist or anything. It was one of the, I loved dance, so my parents said, okay, the teacher can come home and teach you. So it was just for my own love. And then I stopped in like in those days, people got married very early. I had a child by 23 and um, we came to the United States and I was 26 years old. And I never ever dreamt that I would ever dance again in my life. It was never even in my deepest part of my mind. But then Minneapolis, um, there was a, a small Indian community at that time, less than 100 and the Tamil Association president asked me, since they knew that I had studied dance, if I would dance for the Diwali function at the Kaufman Union. And I know that most people would never take that because 10 years you have not danced, but I did not want to lose that opportunity. So somebody, I bought a $25 tape recorder. Someone gave me an alariku. I'm saying this because you know what that is and a piece on Shiva. And I made the piece up and from my memory of what I remembered, and I danced at the car for the Diwali function. They, they liked it. I fell in love with it again. I was asked to teach little kids, but I knew that I didn't know enough to teach. So 79, Diwali, December 80, I started to go to India to make myself not more knowledgeable in the form. And we kept going until, I'm not going to say the whole story, but um, met our teacher now, who's our teacher, Alamel Valli, in 1983 in Minnesota. And that was the starting of my, even though I had done a lot before that to make, to um, show people what Bharatanatyam is, it was meeting my teacher that made my life into what it is right now. And I will let Aparna take off from there. But I have to say one thing. She danced with me when she was three and a half. And she's still dancing with me. I'm 68. <laughs> I am delighted. Well, um, I, the feeling is mutual. <laughs> but um, so in talking about our early days, as my mother said, we met our, our teacher, the, um, the master dancer choreographer, Alamil Bali here in Minnesota, which we always just think is, is just an in incredible um, event that something like that can happen for immigrants here in Minnesota and at the University of Minnesota is where we met. She was invited to do a residency. And so at that time, um, she and her, and we took a workshop from her and our teacher invited us to study uh, with her back in India. And from that moment, I think maybe within months, we started spending several months in India, in, in Madras every year and um, four months. And my mother made it possible for us to, uh, to go during the school year. She would talk to our schools. We would pack up all our schoolwork. My grandfather would hire one of his PhD students in entomology to be our tutors. And we would study in the morning and then spend the next eight hours with our teacher every day, studying with her and her mother who have been so generously giving of their time and their knowledge to us. 
And from an early age, I would say that um, I, I've always been in love with this art form. There is something where I, it, I deeply connect with it, I, I, the music. And, and I think though that what really sparked it is seeing my teacher, Arumil Wali, perform. And she has this, um, while her choreography is incredible, her grasp of poetry, her musicality, she has this amazing joy that she feels on stage, that she brings to each member of the audience. And you feel like you're the only person in the room. And we have been watching her now for decades. And so that is something that has kept us going all of this time. And so now I'll turn it over to Ashley. So for me, I was lucky enough to have this <clears throat> amazing um, emotional, or sorry, this, this feminine energy that was just so devoted to Bharatanatyam throughout my entire upbringing. It was always about dance and music surrounding me. So that was a very um, interesting way to grow up. But at the same time, I was the one of the three of us born here. And so I was also very interested in what, what it's like to be an American and have all these different kinds of experiences with, I used to be really interested in drawing and singing and acting and doing all kinds of different artistic disciplines along with Bharatanatyam. But it was not my favorite art form when I was very little. And I danced throughout um, middle school, throughout college. And then I took a break and moved to New York City after college and was a uh, book publicist. And during that time is when I realized when I took this break, how much I missed not only the connection to India, but this very specific combination of it, like you said, Sri, emotions and physicality and all the joy that you can bring to the stage with better than I can. And I realized what a gift had been given to me through my family and that I needed to continue on with this legacy and, and you know, so few of us will have studied from our guru, Srimati Aramir Bali, and, and being able to continue on that specific lineage and also bring my own perspectives to it, which has been a great um, learning experience as well. Um, it's just a different path, which ended up working um, as a family. We've skipped a few years there in between, but that was the, <laughs> that, those were the very early years. <laughs> No, it's uh, so great to hear about your uh, journey. I mean, it's, uh, and, and you know, that this happened in Minnesota and that it happened at the university. I think that makes me particularly proud. Yes. Ashwini, no. Ashwini you kind of hit on this um, a little bit with kind of talking about how, you know, your legacy and journey was maybe different than your sister and your mother. And Ronnie, I mean, you didn't even imagine that dance was in your career path. Um, and so I would be interested to hear a little bit about kind of what legacy means to each of you and how you've both carried the legacy of dance into your lives, but have also built upon that. And then thinking forward to what legacy are you leaving behind? I think it's such a heavy, <laughs> heavy thing to think about, but I'd be curious from each of you how you reckon with each of these uh, components of your lives. I think, to, shall I start? Yes. So when you first, you know, when you get this opportunity, I think the most interesting thing for me is having an art form that is so amazing, that has been passed on for thousands of years and practiced by great artists and each one of them have shaped and made their own. So it's an art form that has grown all through the years. It's never been stagnant. So here you have a form that's great and it comes from the gods. There is so much spirituality in it. And then I have my teacher. She's another amazing person who has done phenomenal things with this art form. So to begin with, you don't exist. There are two great masters in front of you. So just to start and to establish yourself to Educate. There was nobody here when I first, 40 years ago, when I started dancing, to educate audiences, to educate presenters, to educate uh, funders. That was my job. You know, we never thought about lineage, never thought about anything else. But, but meeting, meeting this teacher was also an unbelievable, it's like one in a million chance here. And to get an opportunity to study with her is another huge chance. So the whole many years went by 
in order to just grasp what she has given us and to make embody this as an older dancer older in the sense i was only 29 <laughs> but still that's pretty old and then gradually to have you know have a daughter who's cons i mean you didn't think that okay i have to teach it to her so that she would carry it on it was natural the two i never thought a 3 year old was too young she never thought a 68 year old is too young too old so we have grown together we practice together and so it has become part of like inseparable partnership between us and then it's so lucky that ashwini by even though i did i forced her quite a bit but forcing didn't happen she naturally came and joined the um what do you call it the partnership so what is we have done so far i think my job is i have two people i've already left a great legacy <laughs> now they are they are you know bringing it forward but also as a company we have i have we have got two two dancers who have danced with us since and both of them are not indian i have tamara who is um, part she's half jewish half cuban who joined our company in when it started she has been dancing with us for 27 years so here again there are two and jessica and so we have it, it's it's been a it's not been you know we have never made this into a large school where we teach hundreds and hundreds of people but kept it pretty tight and small like a harvard for them yeah. i think they will talk about lineage well, I think um, the lineage. in addition to all of this, and I think it is, it is important to emphasize that my mother and I have always been on this journey together. It hasn't been a handoff or a, a training or a shaping, but, but really growing together in our experiences. And while we obviously had different backgrounds growing up when initially we really did grow into the dancers and creators we are i mean obviously ronnie had done so much even before me but shaping each other has been has been a truly wonderful experience but what i find really remarkable and um in this whole experience is this idea of of timelessness so bharatanatyam is not stuck in a place it's not relegated to a place or a time only it is it is so contemporary, as Sri said, it is able to, to mingle and meet and merge with our thoughts today, with us, with, we talk about myth and ancestors and the gods, but we also talk about poetry from today and how that is so relevant in, in the world. And so the idea that art forms can not only present it as they were, as they evolve with each person, but as we do in terms of, of, of layering them with other forms, other genre of music and dance. The idea that you can create something that is so much bigger than the, the, the culture from which it came or the, the place where it started or the time which it started or the, or the place we are now. And I think that's something that all of us as artists, we feel such, um, I would say a, a debt and a dedication to our foundations but there is so much freedom with that as well and i think that's just been been really incredible for me to experience um i'll just say that you know what i take from this is having having had role models um my whole life that were that did what they wanted to do with this culture-based dance form that nobody around us had seen or heard of before and watching them educate as Ronnie said the the presenters and the funders and the audiences and seeing that happen I had that role model that a lot of people don't get to have and so now the you know I get to be a part of that for the next generation for people who can see what we're creating what we have created um, when we tour, it's oftentimes as one of the few companies of this form that is touring the country and able to introduce people to the form. So then after us, people will have seen it. And that's just, that feels really great. So that, 
you know, totally fascinating to me. And I, but I just uh, also wonder, you know, I mean, this is a, a dance form, which, you know, folks in South India are, of course, extremely familiar with it. And in some ways, it's evolved even in India to, you know, to address issues of, you know, empowering women. It's, you know, through, through mythological stories sometimes, but, you know, it really picks up on ideas which existed, you know, about uh, powerful women, female goddesses, for instance, and, you know, and, uh, and has taken that forward. How has, you know, I mean, how has, uh, you know, the, the, the topic today is very much about, you know, cultivating creativity, but how do you feel that, you know, the, the audiences in America, how do you make this form accessible to them? Has it changed how you do things? How, you know, how has it sort of, how does that intersection, you know, how has it impacted what you do and what, it, what you're doing with this dance form? Nice. Mm -hmm. um, it's very interesting question, Sri. So I'm going to go back to 1992 when I formed Ragamala. Just in 91, I met Robert Bly, the, the Minnesota poet, and I was introduced to his writing of Mirabai versions. And Mirabai, for those who are not familiar, is a, was a princess. She was a saint poet, but originally she was married off to a, she was a beautiful young rich princess. She was married off to a prince, but from childhood, her love was for Krishna. And she really thought that Krishna was going to marry her because her mother once had told her, oh, this procession, who is this person going on a procession? And she, her, her mother who was busy, just wanted to give her some answer and said, oh, that's someone you're going to marry. It was just a, 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 a passing remark to a child, but she took it very seriously. And she became a great devotee and didn't, when she got married to uh, the uh, prince, she did not want to live that life. And so she was challenged in many ways. They thought she was a witch. She was thrown out of the house. Now, Robert, I have always been told she was a religious woman, a person who was very much in love with Krishna. But Robert Bly's translations saw her as a very strong woman who believed in her beliefs. And I just totally fell in love with those six poets, six poems in that book. And called and asked him if he would read it, if I, when I dance, and he agreed. So I did it, I did the dance, of course, Aparna was with me, of the oh, six poems of Mirabai by Robert Bly Reed. He was reading it and I danced to it. And Suddenly, everybody who came to see it, it was at the Studio 6A downtown. And everybody seemed to understand what I was trying to do. It was, it turned into an unbelievably, unbelievably moving experience to hear the beautiful, the words in English spoken with such spirit by Robert Bly. And I got into that spirit and the performance was a moving experience. So then I was, people came and told me how much they loved it. That was the first time I had danced to English words. So I was thinking, you know, it's important that people need to know what, what we are trying to do because this art form is so complicated. It's not enough if I just dance to the Indian community and have them see it over and over again. So Ragamala was formed in order to make this art form accessible. So from 1992 to 1998, I did several performances that were meeting various artists of various uh, genres, but we never exchanged, we never took each other's forms. We kept ours, but we conversed using our own forms to see how they all met and melded and understood and they were different from each other. That was one of the reasons how I built um, an audience to our performance because people were curious. They said, oh, you're performing with Susanna. You're performing with uh, uh, the, what is it, Joe Paula. So they came to see it and slowly they started to understand the, the ability of this art form to stretch and to meet so many cultures. So it is a language. It is like speaking to someone else, but it had all the abilities to, un to be interpreted in ways that you wanted to. But then 
um, we started, when Aparna joined me as artistic director, we went back more and more to our own um, philosophy and mythologies, as you say, but in a larger scale, for example, Britain in Water was about the game board and about the conference of the birds. So where they had this similar meaning, but they are from two cultures. How do we bring these cultures together? So most of our work doesn't take away the, the, what, the richness of our form, but it actually uses, uses a larger um, thought, larger ideas of universal thought and how do we bring that together using our form using various music, using visual art. So we give the audiences many different entry points into the, into the pieces. Wonderful, wonderful. It's just, uh, you know, again, I think just the, the freedom to experiment. I mean, there's just so much about having brought this form, uh, art form to America and how it has uh, inspired in some ways an enlarging of you know, of the way you're presenting, how you're reaching different audiences. I think that is absolutely amazing. Um, I know, I think we, you know, we, I think we could talk about the art for, for a long time, but, you know, I think uh, a lot of us are interested also in how do you actually make a business out of the arts? And I know Alex has some thoughts on it as well. Yeah, well, you know, starting with, uh, we can get into like the nitty gritty of running a business, but I think what you all bring to this is is such a unique partnership. And you've talked a little bit about how you've brought that to life. Um, and obviously dealing with, you know, a, a business partnership is essentially a marriage. And in your in your relationship, it's, it's like a family um, in, in the most literal form. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about that, um, but mostly focused on the idea that starting a business is really risky. And so how do you assess risk together um, and, and take leaps, putting yourself out there in an art form as a risk in itself, um, you know, emotional <laughs> risk, um, but how do you uh, make decisions together? How do you um, assess risk as one of you more risk aware than the other? would love to hear about that. Should I say yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think you can tell that Ronnie is a, a very tenacious person and she, when she started Ragamala, she incorporated in 1992, and, and she was, was very, very good about getting the opinions of people she knew in the field, um, grant makers and heads of organizations. I mean, she was an independent artist, a woman a mother from India who had just, she'd been on the scene, but just kind of did putting her toes into the larger world of mainstream arts, right, coming out of the Indian community. And so really learning um, by just trial and error and being fearless. And so uh, assembling a board of directors, and she used to say, someone asked her, what is the role of your board? And she would say, I cook and they eat. <laughs> and um, they would have meetings at her house and they would, it was just, you know, very basic kind of governance, um, board and and it grew it grew from there in that the main goal was to be able to write grants in order to support these projects these performances the performances because they were collaborative they they involved different artists they involved live music they involved uh, research and development needing space needing dancers they were getting more expensive and so it was about raising the money in order to do it, not to pay oneself, but just to make it happen. And so from an early um, age, I was seeing this and I was a part of it. And then when I graduated from, soon after I graduated from college, I came to join her. And, um, and at that point, we decided that we would, um, we had four dancers and we decided one, two, three, four, four dancers, that we would go full time. And at that point we had, um, uh, anyway, but long, I, I'm gonna cut to the chase. There was a moment when we found ourselves uh, with one staff person being paid and there was a lot of um, mismanagement in the company. And so what we decided was that each of the dancers would take over and do all of the administrative work. And we would just train ourselves 
to write grants, to do the publicity, to run the board, to do every aspect of this organization because we felt value in what we were trying to do. We had a mission, we had work that we believed in, and we felt we had a long way to go. And so that was um, a very scrappy way to start. We're still very scrappy. We have a very small staff and all of us wear many, many hats. We all do administrative work and we dance. So it's, it's like several full-time jobs. And teach. And teach. But, but through that, what we find is that we've assembled a group of people who are completely invested in the work. They know every idea from its conception. They know how each work is created. We are all equal partners in conversation and in sharing. And we continue to do this because we are all very passionate about what we do and we continue to be a scrappy business. Um, we continue to be tenacious and resilient and we go after so many different opportunities and we know that with each opportunity it's more work and we're grateful for it. And so um, in that way we have found a way to do our work and of course there are days and where we're exhausted and we feel you know are we chasing the right dreams we feel like we're chasing everything because we almost we have to we don't have a cushion to fall back on but again it's that belief um somewhere along the way we so we've also been watching other dance companies, mainstream Western dance companies to see how, what is a model? Because really when we look at this, we have no model for ourselves. There isn't a, we didn't do an arts administration degree. My degree is in political science, which means degrees in English. And mine is in drawing and painting. But we <laughs> hadn't worked at other nonprofits, you know, we were, and, and, and we had a product that was completely unique, not just the Bharatanatyam in the mainstream, but what we were creating was extremely unique. So how do we put this out there and, and know what we're doing? So it's really a lot of watching and learning. Um, we worked very hard. We have an agent who is wonderful and believes in the work. We work very closely, but we still have a lot. You know, we just feel that we're constantly learning and we're constantly, it's about trial and error and pursuing all of our leads. And we've each taken on different roles. Um, I would say that Ronnie wants to go after everything. I have to stop her, um, but we talk it out and I think the three of us, there's, a, there's always a balance and a lot of conversation um, and we make it work. We have very different personalities, all three of us. And I think that's wonderful because we have different strengths also and we are not afraid to, to share and to constantly converse, but we are not segmented. We do everything together. That is that is wonderful. I mean, off, you know, often people give you advice that don't do business with your family. I mean, that's, you know, that's often a piece of advice that's given. But in your case, it's clear that you've, you know, you, you are so well and, you know, uh, sort of melded together. I think that, you know, you just kind of are able to sort of take this forward. I, I have, uh, you know, before we go on to the Q&A portion, I think there's something that uh, you know, we're all interested in right now, which is, you know, how has uh, the pandemic in some ways, you know, and the fact that, you know, performance is such a major part of what dancers do and what artists uh, of, uh, of many theater artists and so on do, how has that changed, you know, your residency, what you're doing, and how do you think it might influence what you do in future? Well, should I start? Okay. Um, yeah, it's been, I mean, obviously it's been a difficult year for everybody. And in some ways it really were, you know, everybody's um, experiencing this empathy and we're becoming a kind of a smaller world and community for that. Um, but then on the other side, what we do is we do, we, we share with people on stage and in a spontaneous way. And that has been definitely limited. So what, um, what we have done 
And just for ourselves and for our souls is that we practice together almost every day. We practice separately, we get together, we work together. Um, and that's been very helpful towards, during this pandemic. We have a lot of projects. We have a major uh, premiere that had, has been postponed. We continue to work on it. It's becoming more challenging to work remotely with musicians in India and dancers who live on the East Coast. Um, and even dancers here, we can't see them. We're working on Zoom. But as much as possible, you know, running a business, starting a business, pursuing a life as an artist, it's all difficult. It's rewarding, but it's all difficult, just like it's difficult now. So it doesn't feel in some ways like a different lesson or a different path. You just have to find the new way to get your work done and to, and to get what you want to do done and figure out when, where, and how. And you have to be creative about it. And I think the fewer resources you have, the fewer opportunities that you have, you have to shore that up from within you. and. Like I said, you be, I mean, what we do, we're creative people. So we have to be creative in getting it out there. And I think moving forward, what we learn is that we can, we've done several events online and we've been able to connect and reach people, more people than we would have live. And that's something that we're talking about really adding to our practice. Obviously the live events will continue. Hopefully the travel events will traveling will, will happen again, but this online presence, just becoming more comfortable with it and becoming um, more efficient and resourceful in that way is something that we'll do. And, and maybe more lessons, just more resilience. I think we, as artists, we love our work. That's one of the things that you cannot, nothing can take it away. So even if it's, one-on-one -on -one practice to improve ourselves. We have to improve also ourselves for the rest of the life. So it gives you that time to work on yourself and hope that you may, you will be able to show that someday. But that I think that love for the form or for our arts is a very important thing that keeps you going. It's, well, one of the things I was gonna just add on to the last question, which transitions into what Ronnie's saying is, the risk, of, you know, again, growing up, watching them do this and then following in their footsteps, the risk almost felt pushed to the side because of the love of the form. You know, they, and then as I grew up and this is when I'm two years old, you know, I see the, the focus on our teacher style and the form. And it was almost like it was so, the form itself is so great that you can't go wrong by following that. And so we have to keep going even through all these hardships, it, you know, if we've gone this far. No, that's, that's just such a great message there because it's, you know, it's the passion that kind of keeps you going. And it, that's what gets you up in the morning, gets you to rehearse, gets you to pursue the next opportunity, all of that. Yes. And that struggle is, you know, as you say, for artists, that's an ongoing struggle. It's never something that is, you know, uh, you can't say, oh, that, you know, that was last year. Now we're comfortable and we're, you know, we're OK. And so that's I think that and, it, and, and I think the struggle is part of that whole process of creativity as well. So absolutely, it's the longing, you know, where the longing is constantly there. It, it actually builds and, and that's it's a drive. Right, and it's a and it's a passion for excellence. It's a passion to create. I mean, this is just. Uh, I mean, these are just great messages for I think all artists, and not just artists, for all entrepreneurs, all anyone who is trying to sort of uh, stretch themselves in any way. So you know, thank you for that. I know we have questions from the audience. Alex, is there anything you'd like to ask before we move to audience questions? No, I think we have a few questions here. Would you like me to take them or Kristen, would you like me to dive in? Sure. So we have one question here from Anthony. He says, do you feel that different geographic locations in the US respond to your work differently or similarly? Well, it's very interesting. Um, you know, we have a long history of creating work here. And so the audiences here in Minnesota have seen our artistic trajectory and the experiments that we've undertaken. It's like performing for your family. There's a lot of love and, um, and they know the background. They know where we've come from. They've seen our teacher perform here so many times. And so that's one experience. 
And it's always, you know, when people question how this dance form can thrive and survive in Minnesota, in the Midwest, we tell them that we can't imagine anywhere else where it could have in the way that we've experienced it. Mm -hmm. And then when we perform on the East Coast or in New York, um, audiences who are used to seeing um, a lot of dance and a lot of uh, very avant-garde or contemporary dance, um, they're, they're what they prefer and what they like and what they respond to is slightly different. Perhaps they want to take um, take more ownership about the their own interpretation of the work and they don't want to be uh, their hand held through it. And then I think people on the West, I mean, this is, we're really generalizing, but from what we've seen, there are, you know, and then there are people who are very sensitive to the, um, this, the spirituality that's really embedded in our form. And, and of course, you know, they live in different places, but you have different you have audiences, some audience, some audiences respond more to the music. Some respond more to our story as family. Some respond. So it's really interesting to see that as well as we travel. And, and in India too, we have had pretty, very good reception. People have really enjoyed what our performance is there. So we, it, it is, it, with our tours, it varies, but I think in general, we have had a very good uh, track record of people <laughs> liking our work. So um, that's what I would say. Right. No, I mean, the, and the dance form too has, you know, it's even within the U.S. It is, you know, it's it's evolved differently. I mean, you know, what it means, the meaning of what you do with the dance uh, is 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 different for different families, for different, you know, uh, you know, societies. You know, even um, um, within the Indian community or the Indian diaspora in the United States, I think it's viewed very very differently and. This, uh, you know, sometimes it's a little troubling that you know, I find it troubling anyway. <laughs> I don't know about others. When I see the sort of the younger generation of Indian Americans, for them, Indian dance is Bollywood. And then, you know, it sort of drives me crazy. But yeah. <laughs> we know on that. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but it's, uh, but it's, you know, you have to sort of say, okay, maybe that's how they, you know, they um, uh, internalize, you know, the legacy of the culture in some, you know, in, 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 a, in a different way. So it's, uh, you know, there's- uh, As long as they engage in some kind of art, mm -hmm. that's how people see it. That's right, yes, that's right. Um, are more questions, Alex? Yes, we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, Thor asks, well, it says, you are fearless in your willingness to collaborate beyond your art form and to experiment. Has there ever been an instance in which this has proven unsuccessful? And if so, how did you deal with that and learn from it? Failure can be a beautiful opportunity to grow. We haven't. I, I can say we have not had a failure, I would say. But, um, you know, I think there has to be, whether it's musicians we are collaborating with, you have to have you know, a very good understanding of what dancers expect from musicians. Sometimes there is a, if that doesn't happen, then even though the product is pretty good, the experience is not that great. So you have to make, make sure that when we all collaborate, we find, we find the right people who do it. Yeah, I mean, I would say that when you um, when you undertake all of these different projects, I mean, it's a great amount of risk. We were talking about risk, not just in the in the business. I mean, you're taking huge artistic risk, which is much bigger because you're really committing several years to this project, and um, and you work with so many different personality types. And even if the project can be a success. Sometimes you know you have experiences within that project that are challenging, and you really learn to, um, you know, to to assess your relationships, to assess people, to assess your working styles, and in that way, I think it's been really great too for us to talk about: um, Do we really want to go? You know, what are the warning signs here, and do we want to pursue this? And how big a project do we want to do? And how much time do we want to spend? Yeah, I mm -hmm. just um, the one thing I would say as the newest choreographer I've only made, made a couple of projects um, but I you know I you go into it thinking that you know what everything is going to turn out to be 
from start to finish. You have the whole thing figured out and then it definitely doesn't happen. <laughs> and the end product is magically something you never expected. And at the beginning, there's so many times in that where you think, this is not working out the way I want it. What am I going to do? And then in the next project, now that you've already gone through that, it's just a different, you know, a different experience. And I just think learning how to navigate that for me has been very, very, um, a, a very enlightening experience. I have one uh, thing that I would like to share, which is um, many years ago, I did a project called Transposed Heads, which is Thomas Mann's story with Bharatanatyam and ASL. So my idea was to have several um, interpreters and myself doing the story. And I was talking to um, a, a deaf theater director and he was really upset that I didn't want to work with a deaf actress or actor. And why do I want to work with an interpreter? He says, this is, uh, my, this is our culture. If you are really going to work with ASL, you should work with a deaf actress. And I didn't realize it, it's a learning process when you walk into something thinking that you want to do something. And then I ended up working with Nicole Zapko. I'm sure you have seen her doing the interpreting for our governor. So I did the show. The two of us played the two characters of um, uh, in the story, and it turned out just a most amazing experience. So again, we have to listen to what other people say and, and come up with a good place where we can succeed. I, I love hearing about this iterative process. And I think that is, that's the sign of an entrepreneur to be able to build and learn and grow and you know fail or learn again <laughs> um, over and over again. There's, I'm sure there's quite a few folks in the audience here tonight who are aspiring business owners or aspiring artists as well, or some sort of combination of the two. Um, so what type of advice would you um, give folks who are just about to start their journey on the business and the art side? I, I will just say one thing is to not ever lose hope. If you think you have a good, if you want to do something and you really know that that's what you really want to do, hold on to it and, and don't um, have many, many doubts. Go straight, ask for help, keep continuing to work hard to make your dreams come true. It's not easy, but and I would say that don't be afraid to ask questions like Ronnie said, but also constantly ask for help, ask for advice, ask for feedback when you don't get grants. Call, pick up the phone and call people. I know people now love to send text messages and emails, e maybe emails, but you know, personal relationships, building a network, building friendships, that is very important. I don't think that's going to change in business. Business is not going to be all texting or whatever people, young people are doing these days. And so I think those personal relationships are really important. It's how we learn. It's how we get ideas. It's what inspires our creativity. And just, um, and, and never, I think never feel like you're, you deserve something because once you feel that as something that you ex you should get something or something's expected to come to you because then you won't be stretchy and you won't be scrappy and you won't go for it all in. And I think that's really, really important to know that you, um, you have to fight for what you want and be nice while you do it. They're giving all the answers. I, I have to say something, which is that <laughs> it was so similar to that, which is that if you don't get something, it doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean your idea was bad, but you just rework it and keep working on it and keep, um, you know, honing it. Um, and then I would say, if you enjoy reading, read a lot. Because I think when you, the, all the ideas I've ever gotten in, in choreography has been from reading um, or, or even just augmenting. And, you know, constantly when we have a project or when they have a project, it's, the next idea or the next layer comes from some source material. So I think it's really important to stay informed, especially as we're in screens all the time. I feel that that's important. So don't take disappointment as a rejection, keep working. 
I think you should read a lot and have um, uh, real have like real passion for that idea. If it doesn't, if the idea keeps nagging at you, it's a good one. Also, <laughs> I have to say that um, when I first came here, I thought Bharatanatyam is the only form. There is no other which can even come close to this. But my whole, my entire vision got bigger when I started to watch other performers, other cultures, other um, uh, dance forms, theater forms, opera forms. And then you understand what you're just one speck, one small speck in this wide world with so much around you. Learn from everything. I think that's what actually is so important. Like not to think what I do is best, but to make sure that you are learning from everything that you see around. Well, I think that's so, so think nice. There is, there's a question which I think follows very, you know, well from what you've said about, you know, uh, advice for people who are starting out and who are trying to do uh, get into the business as well. And that is, uh, we have a question from uh, Kristen, whose doc says, Ragmala has been very successful in attracting investors to artistic work in the form of commissions. How did you develop that skill and capacity? Because I think one of the questions that people always have, or any entrepreneur, anybody in business, is how do you you know, get the funding to do what you need to do? And how did you develop those skills? So this all goes to relationships. If that you don't build a relationship in hopes that they will commission you or invest in your work, you meet people who you, 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 there's, there's a spark and perhaps they like your work. Perhaps you have a conversation at a performance somewhere and you, and, and something really strikes and then they maybe present you. And then when that happens, you, you develop a, a relationship and they're very interested in the work, you're interested in their feedback. And so it's a two-way relationship. And so I have, and we have worked very hard because we value these friendships. We have several people in the field who we consider our, our friends and who respect the work and who see something in the idea that in the ideas that we have. And we may bring you ideas like fires of Varanasi, which are from our Indian heritage, but the idea is that there is a relevant message for all of us in that. And they may find that that will, would serve their community well. And so then we have very um, ongoing creative conversations about how this work could further serve their community and what are the different ways in which we can engage their community, how the work itself may make an impact on a festival or on their stage. And then we talk about how perhaps they can um, be a part of the work. And so it's all about the relationship building, but it comes from a very, um, a place of respect and friendship. Also, um, somebody said um, many years ago when we were listening to a talk at the NEA conference that you always have to have five years of work planned. It's not, so when you have, you, your ideas are coming and you're making those solid, every time you have an opportunity to talk about it, talk about it with intelligence, with passion, with what you see it. And it sometimes fits into people's, what they are thinking of as the next project. And then always make sure you say, you do what you say and you do it hundred percent the way that you would do it for your own family. So what happens is they know if you commission Ragamala, the work will be done. There is no excuse. They will not say, okay, I was not, you know, I didn't have time. I, I couldn't practice. You know, it's, it's work ethic, hundred um, percent hard work, doing a good job and saying and doing what you say you will do. I think it's important. All of this, all of what Aparna said, and all of us, what we said, we we work towards building that confidence in people, so they know, okay, we can commission Ragamala because we know they. I'm sure they will, because we sell our products three, four years in advance, before we know what it is a complete project. So I think all of that is like important things to keep in mind. No, I mean, you're talking about passion, you're talking about commitment, you're talking about hard work. 
you're talking about building relationships, networking, and these are just, I think, lessons for all entrepreneurs and uh, persistence. I mean, just this idea that, you know, that you keep sort of, uh, you know, working at what you believe in. And I think that's, that shines through in everything that you're saying. I know there's a, uh, there is one, uh, there is a, uh, and uh, a question about choreography as well. And the question from uh, Lisa is, as choreography for a piece is developing, is there a particular way it evolves? And in other words, is the footwork choreographed separately from the facial expressions or the hand mudras, hand gestures? Wow, that's a big question. So, um, for us, when we create a piece or create a new work, um, obviously the concept comes first. So we think about um, the, what it is that we want to explore, what is the relevance for us, what is the point of connection for us. Then we, we work on our research and we work on lyrics, working with um, musicians and composers. And so when you, before even the choreography can start, there are, there's, there are months and years of work really living within the ideas. And when you work with music, you're working with the, the real emotion of the piece. And so you're, you're constructing all of these, um, these elements first. And then when you start to choreograph, it really depends on the song. It depends on the theme of that particular section. If it's going to be, um, you know, choreography is always going to be a full body experience. It's not just going to be feet or hands. Even though they may all be doing different things, there is a, um, a holistic experience in doing that. And so depending on if it's a narrative section or if it's a rhythmic section, ensemble section, a solo section, um, we, I don't know how to answer the question. Well, I feel like and, and, and it evolves so much. I mean, like, I'm, like Ronnie was saying, if a project is four years in the future and then three years and then two years and they start getting honed and then once it starts touring, it will still change. It's, it's alive and um, things might be more lived in the body after so and might make decisions plus there is always the improvisatory element um so it's it's a big question and, and it's I different from piece to piece it is and i think it's also different if you're choreographing for yourself or you're choreographing for others and you're watching something uh, you're building something that you're watching and then if you get up and do it it always feels different or you'll change it so um it is it becomes it's both a technical process as well as it can be a really um, much larger emotional process as well. It depends on the day, I think, and the minute. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a living thing. I mean, it's so it's wonderful to hear that. Um, Alex, is there anything else you would? The last question, I think we've already answered a, a little bit of it, but I did want to just point out how precise your craft is as, as entrepreneurs and business owners. And um, one thing that we talk about a lot at the coven is like when we get kind of flustered in the, in the nose that we eat for breakfast or, you know, like getting rejected from, on, uh, from investors and that type of thing, we think about like, we keep returning to the thing that we know really well like what is one thing I can do every day that I know how to do and for you know some of us it's like writing for some of us it's working out I know how to lift up a weight and put it back down <laughs> it doesn't even have to be that heavy it's just I know how to walk I'll go outside and take a walk what are what would you say is like your grounding piece is it dance or is it something else that is a little bit more um you know kind of grounding and peaceful for you our teacher we, all we have to do is just bring her in front of us and we are all back. No matter where, in what situation we are, we are down someday, we, all we have to hear is a, a piece of song, a song that she has taught us and we dance it and we can see her dancing and we just channeling her actually gives us, brings us all back into this thing again for me. I think, yes, I agree. I think it would be dance because um, we talked earlier about, I mean, this at this time during the pandemic, I mean, there's so much out of our control, uh, but we can still work on our dance. And that's how I feel. And we have not stopped. And because of the little bit of less, so many different things going on, I have felt a real change in my dance in the last nine months and the upper nines really been helping me. And that feels like something really important and, and like a big step during this time. So that's what I would say. Yeah, I would, I would agree with all of this. I think that 
absolutely going back to our to to our relationship with our teacher or the reason why we do everything um is is it's just it's inspiring it's inspiring it drives us and it, it it brings up all of the different emotions i think and i think part of this is that we're not we don't always feel the same way every day some days we are down and some days we are hard on ourselves and we should look at that and say, okay, maybe that's something I can work on. And some days we're really proud of ourselves and it can all be inspired by the same thing. And when we, so our, this is very grounding for us. When we really return to our, the reason why we do all of this is um, it's very moving, it's very moving. And I think this time especially has been that practice time has been protected. It has been protected from the pandemic. It has been protected from all the, the homeschooling and all the different things that some of us are involved in is because it's just us in the space doing either working on something that we're not doing very well or we're doing it well that day. But the ups and downs of that activity are always the same, regardless of what's going on outside. You are blessed. I mean, frankly, to have the arts, to have dance, as something you're so passionate about. It's a, it's a blessing, especially in times like this. And we can see how it's grounding you in such, a, such an important way. I think with that, I think we're almost close to end of time. So I just want to, first of all, say thank you to the three of you. You've done, you know, it's just been amazing to have you here and to hear from you in, in person. And Alex, thank you so much again for the coven, for the help that you're doing and for all the wonderful work you're doing. I wish we could have a separate conversation just with you, you know, that would be so much fun. And uh, thank you again to Northrop for organizing this and inviting me over. And I know Kat probably has some final words to say about, you know, what's happening in Northrop next and when do we get to see Fire in Varanasi? Well, we just want to thank say you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you so much. Really, I really enjoyed the opportunity to yeah, meet and, and have the conversation with both of you. It has been wonderful. Next time, we want to ask you both <laughs> questions. <laughs> I'm so excited just to be a fly on the wall for all of this, but thank you. I'm, I'm echoing everything you all have said is thank you for, for Sri and Alex for being expert moderators this evening. Thank you to Rani Aparna and Ashwini for your sharing your experiences with us. I know some of the students we have tuning in this evening really appreciate hearing you know, the path that you've taken and knowing that there are paths for them as well. So this is all, and, and myself included, I'm, we're all on a path. So I appreciate all of that so much. And uh, we will just look forward to seeing you for your performance in April. Um, please do check back to the Northrop website for more uh, engagement opportunities like this. Um, some experiential things, some more discussions. We'll have those posted soon that we're, that we're gonna share with Ragamala Dance Company. So thank you all again. Um, have a lovely evening. Thank you all for tuning in and we'll, we'll talk again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.